Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Antigen-Specific CD4 T-cell Responses in Humans, SARS-CoV-2 and Beyond. I am Michelle Ashton of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Meltony Biotech. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speakers. Dr. Alexander, Alexander Scheffold, Director, Institute of Immunology, Kiel University in Germany, and Dr. Felix Epler, Global Product Manager, Cell Sorting at Miltony Biotech. Dr. Sheffield and Dr. Epler, you may now begin your presentation. Hello and welcome from my side to today's webinar. My name is Felix Epler. I'm Product Manager for Cell Sorting Solutions here at Miltony Biotech. And in today's webinar, we would like to address the question whether the common cold coronavirus is either a protector from or rather an exacerbator of COVID-19. Our webinar will be split into two parts today. First, I will talk about a technical highlight, the Max Quantido cell sorter, a system which allows for aerosol-free and gentle cell sorting in a closed cartridge system. And in the second part, Alexander Scheffold from the University of Kiel will talk about a study he and his group conducted recently uh, and focus on antigen-specific CD4 positive T cell responses in humans and thereby on SARS-CoV-2 and beyond. So let's start with a technical introduction and let's have a closer look to the Max Quantido cell sorter. But before we do so, I would like to give you a short overview on the general product portfolio at Miltony Biotech. As you can see, we try to cover whole workflows, starting with sample preparation, including subsequent cell isolation or cell sorting, cell culture and cell activation and expansion possibilities, but then also cell analysis using flow cytometry as well as microscopy. In an ideal world, these workflows then can be easily translated into the clinical segments. So from benchtop to bedside, and this is also something we are focusing on here at Milton e Biotech. Since we're talking about coronaviruses today, I'd also like to take the opportunity to shortly um, highlight a few of our uh, products, uh, which help researchers around the world in order to understand the SARS-CoV-2 in much more detail. Um, these are different reagents, for example, our SARS-CoV-2 peptivator peptide pools or the SARS-CoV-2 antigens, um, but also analysis kits and sorting kits, for example, for SARS-CoV-2 specific B and T cells. And of course, there's specific instrumentation supporting these researchers. And one of them, as said before, is the Max Quantido cell sorter, which I will focus on in the following few slides. So if we talk about flow cytometry-based cell sorting, most of the people think about fax droplet sorters. These are the systems which you mainly find in the laboratories and core facilities. If we talk about sorting of infectious material, these systems come with a few problems. And that is the first, that they are open system and produce droplets as well as aerosols in an open space but they also share their fluidics and tubings. And for most of the systems, it's very difficult to exchange those. And this means that a lot of, um, yeah, uh, very uh, difficult and um, time consuming uh, decontamination processes are needed in between samples. Last but not least, um, if you're thinking about uh, going into delicate downstream analysis of the cells, for example, cell, um, single cell genomics, but also functional analysis. A problem can also be that the sorting process itself on droplet sorters can be very harsh and depending on your cell type, create problems 
with downstream functionality or also artifacts in your analysis. And we think that we have a very good alternative to conventional droplet-based systems with the MaxQuant Taito cell sorter. The MaxQuant Taito is a benchtop sized cell sorter allowing for a controlled sample temperature between 4 and 25 degrees of Celsius. And there are no external fluidics. So really what you place into your laboratory is what you can see here on this picture. The title comes with three different lasers, eight fluorescence channels and four scatter channels, and thereby allows for quite some flexibility in terms of antibody panel design. The heart of the system is the MaxQuan Tidal cartridge, which has three different chambers. An input chamber, where the sample of interest goes into, a positive collection chamber, where the target cells will end up after the sorting procedure, and a negative collection chamber, where all the rest will simply flow into. Cell sorting as well as analysis take place at a small microchip at the bottom of the cartridge, which is depicted in this picture here. Just for your understanding how small the microchip really is, I'd like to show you this size comparison here. So in order to understand its architecture a little bit better, we need to zoom in. And here you can already see the channels which directly connect the microchip with the different chambers of the cartridge. If we zoom in again, we see the architecture of the chip. You can see different channels and the cells coming from the input chamber enter the microchip at the lower left-hand side and then run through the sorting channel where the cells are analyzed. And if a, if a target cell is identified, the sorting procedure will be initiated and the sorting procedure itself will be carried out with a very fast microvalve. And we can also have a closer look to this procedure. So here you can see the microvalve, which is actually opened by a magnetic pulse coming from a solenoid. One opening and closing cycle takes around 30 microseconds, which allows for up to 30,000 microvalve openings and closings per second. Here you can see an animation of the sorting uh, mechanism itself. Cells coming from the input chamber pass the three different lasers, and in case of positive target cells has been identified, a magnetic pulse opens the microvalve which then very gently redirects the cells into another channel leading into the positive collection chamber. All the rest flows through into the negative collection chamber. The only thing coming in and getting out of the cartridge during the sorting process is sterile filtered air. It enters the cartridge at its bottom through an 0.1 micrometer hydrophobic filter, and then before entering the input chamber, runs again through another 0.1 micrometer hydrophobic filter, ensuring sterility of the air before entering the input chamber. Also, the ventilation ports at the um, positive as well as the negative collection chambers are covered with those hydrophobic 0.1 micrometer filters. An interesting study coming from different groups at the National Institute of Health in USA which has been recently um, published in Applied Biosafety, validated the application of the Max Quantido cell sorter in a BSL-3 containment setting. So what did the authors do in the study? They used fluorescent beads and sorted them either on the Max Quantido or on a BDFAX area 2 with the aerosol management system disabled, and then used the gold standard for detection of aerosolization of instruments Cyclex D impactors in order to check whether aerosols and thereby also fluorescent beads had been released from the systems during the sorting process. As you can see on the right hand side, the FAX area 2 with its aerosol management system disabled released a lot of um, fluorescent beads, uh, which is a strong indicator for a strong aerosolization during the sorting process. In contrast, the MaxQuant Tidal did not release any aerosols at all during the sorting process. Also not once the cartridge was opened post sorting. The authors concluded that this instrument is not only suitable for BSL-3 due to its small footprint, but most importantly, because it does not generate aerosols during the sorting procedure. So let's shortly sum up. Where are the benefits of using the MaxQuant Tidal for sorting of infectious material? We have a closed and sterile sorting environment 
and no sample to sample carryover as there are no internal fluidics or tubings present in the system. If you use a new cartridge, you always use a completely new fluidic system. There are also no contamination and therefore also no decontamination processes uh, needed in between samples. And most importantly, no aerosols are produced with a microvalve mediated sorting process. But it's not only about safety, it's also about the gentleness of the Max Quantido. It operates at very low pressure and therefore the cells do not experience any decompression or charge and also only encounter mild shear forces, which is of course very important for delicate downstream analysis of functional assays, um, which are uh, conducted post sorting. One of these delicate downstream analysis, uh, which is in a strong need for high quality samples and therefore also for gentle cell sorting technologies or in general, gentle sample preparation technologies is um, the genomics analysis of cells. For example, if you're interested in transcriptomics. As you can see on the right hand side in a direct comparison between epithelial cells and their transcriptomics after they had been sorted either using the Max Quantito or a conventional droplet sorter, you can see that um, certain signaling pathways directly connected to stress, such as apoptosis, mitochondrial genes, or oxidative stress, that these are higher um, and stronger expressed in the cells which had been sorted using the droplet sorter. So it really is key what kind of technology you use, um, and it will influence the data you will receive in the end. If you're interested in more details on um, this application and uh, the background of the study, then please uh, have a look at another webinar from our site, uh, Realize Better NGS Results Through Gentle Cell Sorting. This is available at the Milton Biotech website as well as here on Lab Roots. And with that, I'm really happy to hand over um, to Professor Dr. Alexander Scheffold. Um, as said, he's the director at the Institute of Immunology um, at the Kiel University in Germany. And today he'll discuss um, the antigen specific CD4 T cell response of SARS CoV 2 patients and um, their connection to the cold coronavirus. And with that, I'm already looking forward to listen to your talk, Alexander. And um, yeah, thank you for your attention. Welcome to my talk about SARS-CoV-2 specific CD4 T cell responses in healthy donors and COVID-19. My name is Alexander Scheffold and I'm the head of the Institute of Immunology at the Christians Albrechts University in Kiel. So we still don't understand many aspects of COVID-19. And for example, one uh, striking question is why do some people develop severe COVID-19 whereas others uh, remain, for example, completely asymptomatic? So the, the, there is uh, the idea that adaptive immune uh, responses play a key role in that process. So they could be too little or too strong or just inappropriate uh, responses. On the other hand, there's the question whether pre-existing immune memory could have an influence, either protective, but maybe even harmful. So the characterization of SARS-CoV-2 specific T helper cells, which are actually orchestrating the adaptive immune response, is one of the key aspects of analyzing the adaptive immunity. So one can look on the frequencies, on the phenotypes, also in the antigenic targets, and, but also looking on the functionality of these cells, uh, such as TCR specificities and cross-reactivities, but also the TCR affinities and clonality. Antigen-specific T cells can be identified in two different ways. So either by direct staining with a ligand, this is the peptide MHC molecule, and this allows direct labeling of the antigen-specific T cell receptors, and then these labeled cells can be identified by a conventional flow cytometry. This is the only way of direct TCR labeling, but it requires that we have exactly defined MHC and peptide complexes, 
which need to be prepared. And so far, my, the main analysis is still uh, done in CD8 T cells. The classical way of detecting T cell reactivity is via functional assay. So the idea is just you add the antigen to a, solu to a suspension of antigen presenting cells. Together with T cells, the APC take up the antigen, process the antigen, and present the peptides on the MHC molecules. And then the antigen-specific T cells get uh, activated and start to react with a defined set of effector functions, including rapid cytokine production, expression of certain so-called activation markers on the cell surface, or um, after a longer time of simulation, proliferation occurs. In our hands, the, the, the activation markers CD154 and CD137 have been particularly useful because they require minimal manipulation of only seven hours in vitro st re-stimulation. They can be used to detect basically all pathogens and antigens, ranging from peptide pools, antigen lysates, or recombinant proteins. Of course, this is possible in all donors because we have no MHC restriction. And all T helper subsets somehow upregulate one of these markers, including the FOXP3 positive regulatory T cells. So for some uh, general questions regarding antigen specific cytometry, I would like to recommend this article in the European Journal of Pharmacology. This is a general guidelines for flow cytometry, covering basically everything you can do with flow cytometry and cell sorting. And this also includes um, an overview about the different technologies which can be used to identify antigen-specific B and T cells via cytometry. And the technical aspect in that case has a considerable impact on the interpretation of the data, actually. So one general problem of antigen-specific Cytometry. cytometry is that these cells are typically very rare. And here I just show a couple of examples. This is a CD154 based stimulation based assay detecting CD154 on reactive cells. So this is very low background without, without a stimulation. And here are some classical pathogens. And you can already see that the, typically the frequency of cells is way below 1% in some cases even below 0.1%. That is summarized below here in that cartoon, where you can see that the frequencies are really 1 in 1,000 or even less in the case of autoantigens or naive T cell repertoire. So uh, the, the technology we used for identification of antigen-specific T cells is also based on this in vitro activation with antigen for five to seven hours. And that leads to upregulation of these two molecules on the cell surface of activated T cells. Regulatory T cells make CD137. Conventional T cells make CD154 to CD40 ligand. And here you can directly see the frequencies are really low, about 0.1 or 0.2%. So what we did, we combined this te detection technology with a magnetic filtration step allowing to separate the rare reactive cells from a large population of cells, 10 to hundreds of millions of cell PBMCs, and we can filter out the few reactive cells. And this gives then a sizable population of regulatory T cells shown here in blue, the conventional T cells. And one can now do a really in-depth analysis of these rare reactive cells, looking also on the quality, so on the, the phenotype, the function, the TCR affinity, cytokine production, and do also kind all kinds of omics technologies due to the purification of these cells. So when we applied this technology to blood samples of COVID-19 patients, we got quite striking responses as shown here in COVID-19. So the main reactivity uh, was that directed against the classical targets, spike membrane and M protein, but also some reactivities against other proteins were identified. Interestingly, when we looked at unexposed donors, we also saw basically in every patient, in every donor, we found SARS-CoV-2 reactive T cells also distributed against various antigens. 
And this is summarized here showing that although there's a clear cut difference in the frequencies of SARS-CoV-2 reactive T cells in COVID-19 versus healthy unexposed, basically in every donor we were still able to identify the SARS-CoV-2 reactive T cells. And that is just influenza as a control, there's no difference between patients and healthy. One can summarize that, so the reddish um, labels uh, is indicating the two, three main targets, um, spike, M and N protein. And this is, these are the main targets, especially in COVID-19 patients, in infected patients. Whereas in unexposed, it's more scattered, there are considerable variabilities. So in some donors, also other proteins are the major targets. So to summarize that, S, M and N protein are the main targets in COVID-19. There are more diverse targets in unexposed donors, but in general, Pre-existing memory T cells can be detected in all unexposed donors. So now, of course, the, the question is, are these really SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells we are detecting here? And this is um, now showing the original data. This is after stimulation before enrichment. There's a low frequency of reactive cells in a COVID-19 patient. And this now shows the dramatic enrichment of a lot of reactive cells uh, uh, by magnetic cell sorting. And the same is actually true in unexposed donors, although we can clearly see that here we have much less reactive cells, but still we get a considerable en enrichment of these cells from the unexposed donor. So are these specific? We tested this by generating um, in vitro expanded T cell lines from these enriched cells and then re-stimulated them with the SARS-CoV-2 or control antigens. And as you can beautifully see in COVID-19 as well as in unexposed donors, these T-cell lines exclusively react to the inducing, inducing antigen, but not the control antigen. As you can already see here uh, in the unexposed donors, there's a kind of a higher um, background uh, reactivity against the other antigens as compared to COVID-19, whereas the background is almost zero. I will come back to that later on. So we uh, were wondering about this pre-existing T-cell immunity, and uh, there was the hypothesis that this might be induced by cross-reactivity to common cold coronaviruses, which are causing um, the common cold in, in healthy, uh, in normal people. And, uh, and the idea was that maybe children, uh, because they are frequently infected with these common cold viruses, are better protected from SARS-CoV-2 as compared to elderly, because some of these related antigens cause cross-reactive protective immunity. So as I said, we can detect uh, these antigen-specific cells in all unexposed donors, but when we looked at the phenotype, there was a clear-cut difference. So whereas in COVID-19 patients, there were no naive T cells, as indicated here by CD45RA and CCR7 expression, as expected for a, can, uh, for a memory in, vi in vivo memory T cell response. However, in unexposed donors, these SARS-CoV-2 specific cells, there was a considerable fraction of naive T cells. And that was actually true in all unexposed donors. So it's a highly variable uh, amount of memory versus naive T cells in these unexposed donors against basically all three main target proteins. And again, the control influenza, you, as you expect for a memory response, they are ma mainly comprised of memory cells in unexposed as well as in COVID-19 patients. And most strikingly, again, COVID-19 patients, the SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells were almost completely to, one, uh, to almost 100% uh, of a memory phenotype. So this already suggested that um, um, there's a significant um, heterogeneity in, in me of memory and naive T cells. So the question is, what is the reason for that? Is that due to cross-reactivity or, or is that a general phenomenon within the, um, uh, within the total T cell subsets? And so we just had, uh, well, I just want to show some data on uh, the total CD4 repertoire because as we know, um, the aging has a significant impact on immune repertoire. And that is shown here for two examples. This is a young donor and an old donor. 
And this is just looking here on CD45RA CCR7 again. So we see in the young donor, we have a 70% of naive T cells, whereas in the old donor, there are just 7% of naive T cells. And now, interestingly, when we now enrich the SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells, and these are both unexposed donors, and uh, when we now analyze these uh, SARS-CoV-2 reactive T cells, we realize that also here, the young donor, 70% of the SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells were also naive, versus in the old donor, there were almost no naive T cells in the SARS-CoV-2 reactive cells. And we can plot that, and that is indicating actually that it is just a, a linear, almost linear correlation between the total frequency of memory cells within the CD4 compartment, which we call the immunological age or the immunological experience, increasing memory uh, frequencies. And this is, this is linearly correlated with the frequency of memory cells in the SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells. So indicating that this is not due to a particular pre-infection with a particular virus, but is more or less a function of the general broad memory T cell repertoire, which is increasing in healthy people within a, by, by aging. And that uh, is actually not restricted to SARS-CoV-2. We see exactly the same linear correlation in CMV negative donors against the, so also the CMV specific T cells have exactly the same shape. And again, against a complete neoantigen, the keyhole lymphocytes, hemocyanin, cyanins, KLH, we see the same effect. And again, when we look then uh, as a comparison in CMV exposed or SARS-CoV-2 exposed uh, donors, there is clear cut a pure memory phenotype due to the in vivo activation and expansion and memory formation due to the in vivo infection. So this is actually indicating that the SARS-CoV-2 pre-existing memory correlates simply with the size of the total memory pool, which we call also the immunological age. And now the question is, do these pre-existing memory cells differ from the, cell, the memory cells we found in the COVID-19 patients? So what the next we did, we looked on the functional avidity of the cells. So we took specific T cell lines generated from unexposed or in COVID-19 patients and re-stimulated the cells with graded peptide doses. And as you can nicely see, in unexposed donors, you need extremely high concentration, up to 0.5 microgram per ml to get a response. Whereas in COVID-19 patients, the T cells react already at the lowest dose, 0.001 microgram of peptide. And you can calculate from that the EC50 values. And as you can see, although not all COVID-19 patients uh, develop high affinity responses, but at least some of them do, whereas in healthy people, so the unexposed, uh, the pre-existing memory cells, they are all exclusively of low avidity responses. So to summarize that, the pre-existing SARS-CoV-2 memory T cells are present in all unexposed individuals analyzed. They have low avidity for SARS-CoV-2. And basically, this frequency of pre-existing memory correlates simply with the size of the total memory pool, which is the immunological age or the immunological experience. So the next important question was now, but still, do we see some induction of this cross-reactivity by common cold coronavirus? So uh, we analyzed also the response to the four known members so, uh, of these common cold coronavirus strains. And what we found is that all tested donors had extremely high frequencies of reactive cells, and they were of a complete memory phenotype, indicating really in vivo selection, expansion, and memory formation against these viruses. And that is in striking contrast to the SARS-CoV-2 response in these, in, the, in these very same donors. And when it then had a closer look, as expected for a real infection, the common cold coronavirus specific T cells were all of a relatively high avidity, again, in contrast to the SARS-CoV-2 of these unexposed donors. And finally, we also had the chance to look here on the cross-reactivity. So we took the common cold coronavirus specific T cell lines 
and stimulated them either with an inducing antigen and we got higher reactivities or we re-stimulated with a SARS-CoV-2 and there was almost no reactivity detectable. So basically, what we found is that we find high ability and expanded memory T cells against the common cold coronavirus in virtually all tested donors. However, almost no cross reactivity between these specific T cells and the SARS CoV 2 antigen. The next was then to check whether these SARS CoV 2 reactive T cells contain some cross reactivity. And that is, as first we looked here on the unexposed donors and doing exactly the same experiment, re stimulation of SARS CoV 2 specific T cells with different types of antigens. They, they have high reactivity against, against the three different uh, antigens we use for the generation. However, they have also broad cross-reactivity against a number of different antigens. But that is not only restricted to the common cold coronavirus, but it's also seen against other viruses like influenza, CMV, EBV and adenovirus. So indicating that this cross-reactivity is not restricted to a particular um, antigen or virus. And the next was then to look in COVID-19 patients and the result was quite striking, whereas we still see high reactivities against the three main targets. Basically, these cross-reactive cells are hardly detectable in COVID-19 patients, indicating that upon in vivo infection, there's a positive selection of SARS-CoV-2 specific high avidity cells and a negative selection for these low ability cross-reactive cells. And that can be quantitated by looking on the percent of cross-reactivity in each T-cell line. And it is clear that it's very high in the unexposed, but it's almost completely lost in the COVID-19 situation, showing this clear-cut um, evidence for selection of high ability monospecific cells during the COVID-19 infection. So the, the, the human coronavirus cross-reactive cells, although they are present, they do not really contribute to the SARS-CoV-2 response in COVID-19 infection. And that was actually beautifully uh, confirmed in a recent study where they really analyzed uh, or identified T-cell receptors which cross-reacted especially against the homologous peptide uh, between SARS-CoV-2 and the common corona cold coronavirus, which is frequently identified in in unexposed donors, and the, 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 this work here cloned cross-reactive TCRs and showed that these cloned TCRs really have low avidity, low proliferative capacity against SARS-CoV-2 as compared to the original common cold coronavirus peptide. So this nicely confirms that the pre-existing common cold coronavirus reactive cross-reactive memory cells poorly react against the SARS-CoV-2 um, protein and therefore are probably not relevant or are at least not protective in a situation of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And I just here want to point out um, that this antigen-specific cytometry is really helpful also to improve single cell or in general uh, omics data, which are uh, frequently used nowadays to look on the whole blood, however, and also do TCR sequencing on, the, on that level. However, we should not forget that so far it is not possible to extract from the TCR sequence the specificity. So by combination of global single cell uh, sequencing together with sequencing of in, individual sorted antigen-specific B or T cells and identification of these TCRs in the antigen-specific subsets, one can add the, the specificity and the function into these global T um, single cell uh, RNA profiling experiments. And that is actually what we, what we did. So we, we, we under identified the antigen-specific T cells in SARS-CoV-2 in COVID-19 patients. We did the RT technology and then we made use here of this beautiful GLOW system with a Clinimax title um, and sorted uh, these reactive cells to really high purity, which allowed us then to do functional assays, but also single cell RNA profiling. And this, the idea was here to look whether we see differences 
between patients with mild disease versus severe disease. And the first striking observation was then we, when we looked on moderate and severe COVID-19 patients, we found that those actually have strongly increased frequency of the active cells. So it's not an impaired in immune reactivity in the cells as it was previously reported with other methods. However, the really striking uh, result came when we also now looked on the avid avidity of these T-cell responses. And what we found is that in, in non-hospitalized patients, they had a strikingly high avidity response, suggesting a good selection of high affinity TCRs during infection, whereas in a hospitalized patients, the avidity was similar to the unexposed, indicating that under these conditions, although the response is very strong, the T cells are suboptimal because they only react to SARS-CoV-2 with a very low affinity. And then we also did um, single cell sequencing and identified the TCR profiles of these ex vivo isolated SARS-CoV-2 T cells to look on the clonality of the response. And what we um, can see here that in, again, in hospitalized patients, there's a very high diversity indicating that there's no clonal or only weak clonal selection upon infection, whereas in non-hospitalized patients, the diversity was much lower, indicating really a selection of individual high affinity clones. And that is also somehow reflected here when we look on the different uh, subpopulations within the antigen reactive T cells. And we here just look on the, in black, the top three expanded clones. And you can see here that they are all collected here in one particular subset, which is actually characterized by high affinity, higher activity. Whereas in severe disease, there is not such an accumulation, so they are scattered all over the place and found in all different subsets which were identified in this experiment. So this is um, actually indicating that this is a strong but an unfocused and low ability CD4 T cell response in severe COVID-19. And now, of course, the question is, does the pre-existing memory, which has also this low affinity, contribute to such a low avidity response in severe COVID-19 patients? And we could not completely address this because we had no samples before and after infection. However, we tried to, to filter that out of our data by looking only on a patient group with, with the age between 50 and 65. Uh, and when we looked on them, we still see the same phenomenon. Severe patients have still high frequencies of antigen reactive cells. However, it was interesting to observe when we now look on the immunological age of these patients. So that just looking on the frequency of memory cells in the total CD4 cells, we see that the severe patients have much higher immunological experience or age as compared to the non-hospitalized Versus in healthy, there is a classical um, broad distribution of all memory uh, frequencies. So this is at least suggesting that patients um, with severe disease have a higher immunological age, and this might actually contribute to the development of a poor antigen-specific response upon infection. So to summarize that, increased frequencies of SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells are found in severe COVID-19, and this is independent of age. The, immuno the increased immunological age correlates with COVID-19 severity in this age group. Uh, and we, we still have to do analysis of pair samples before and after vaccination. That is now much more easy than uh, with natural infection that is ongoing. But I just want to show you a couple of uh, or the first results on vaccination. So that is just showing the frequencies. So pre-vaccination level, and we, we see a very strong induction of SARS-CoV-2 reactive T cells upon two times vaccination. And now again, the interesting part is again, the young and old donor I showed you before. So the one which has this large fraction of naive T cells in the SARS-CoV-2 reactive T cells versus the old donor which ha who has almost no naive T cells in the SARS-CoV-2 before vaccination. And if you now look at just on these two donors on the response, you see that the, the young donor had a very low starting level but has a dramatic increase of reactive T cells 
Whereas the old donor has a higher starting level of memory cells, but has only a very mild increase upon vaccination, suggesting that the older patient reacts poorly against the vaccination. And that is actually true for, the, for a number of donors, as shown here. So there's a beautiful negative linear correlation of the, the more memory, frequent, the memory T cells we have pre-vaccination, the lower is the fold expansion in response to vaccination. And the same can be done with just looking at the fre frequency of memory cells in the total CD4 cells, so the immunological age. And that also has a negative co linear correlation with the fold expansion, indicating that the more memory cells we have against SARS-CoV-2 or in total, uh, the lower is the reaction to the vaccine. So to summarize that, so I, th I wanted to make the point that the analysis of the rare antigen-specific lymphocytes is really an important tool to better understand protective and also pathogenic immune responses. And you should not forget that it's just much less than 1% of all CD4 T cells, but they make the difference in such antigen-specific diseases. And uh, pre-existing SARS-CoV-2 reactive memory T cells are really present in all humans, but they have only low functional ability and they have broad target specificities. On the other hand, human uh, coronavirus, so the common cold coronavirus, they are also very abundant, but they do not strongly contribute to the SARS-CoV-2 response following infection. And finally, the most interesting result probably is that in severe COVID-19 patients, we see a very strong response, but this is of very poor quality, indicated by low avidity and polyclonality um, against SARS-CoV-2. And, and um, we, we can also show that the expanded pre-existing memory correlates with a weak response to vaccination. So, in general, the last comment to pre-existing or cross-reactive memory and human T-cell responses in aging. So it seems that there is a correlation of the size of the CD4 memory compartment, which is somehow uh, related to the immunological age. And this seems to be a risk factor for to develop severe COVID-19. This we still have to show, but we can already, we have already indication that it correlates with a weak response to vaccination. And that will be um, analyzed in the, in the future by our group. So as a last point, I want to, to thank the people involved. So the major contribution is by Peter Bacher. She was mainly responsible for this, for planning and, uh, and organizing this, this study together with member of, members of her group, Gabriela Rios Martini, together with members of my own group. The EKMB in Kiel doing the single cell sequencing analysis. And then we have a lot of clinical cooperation partners, especially the people from the hospital, University Hospital in Cologne and also, also uh, in the hospital in Frankfurt, uh, who contributed a lot of uh, clinical samples necessary for doing this analysis. Thank you very much and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Alexander and Felix, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Our first question is, are there different types of cartridges available for the Taito sorter? So maybe I can take this question. Thank you um, very much. A very interesting question. And indeed, um, there are different cartridge types. So um, I included our uh, conventional standard research use only cartridge in uh, my presentation here. The same cartridge design is also available in uh, max GMP format if you're planning to go into clinical applications or working in translational environments. And we also have a high-speed cartridge which runs at double the speed, um, therefore allows for a higher um, cellular processing um, in the same amount of time. 
And uh, this also comes with an additional um, feature, uh, which is inertial focusing of the cell. So you will also have a very good um, resolution inside the sorting channel, which is comparable to the hydrodynamic focusing found in um, dropper-based systems. So there are actually uh, different cartridge types, yes. And the high speed cartridge also will soon be launched in the GMP compliant format. Thank you, Felix. Okay, our next question. What does the system separate during testing of SARS-CoV-2? And how long can a microchip be used? So um, as we're talking um, about a cell sorting system here, we are um, obviously sorting mainly cells. Um, uh, in terms of SARS-CoV-2, we see actually different applications here. In this example, uh, Alexander was uh, presenting, uh, we saw that it was about um, CD4 positive T cells expressing certain markers, and they had also uh, been um, specific for uh, certain kinds of viruses. We also know about, uh, for example, SARS-CoV-2 uh, specific B cells, which have been sorted, uh, also dendritic cells uh, from COVID-19 patients. But uh, of course, you're not only limited to cells, you can also sort um, other uh, organisms such as bacteria or yeast, or we also know um, of um, researchers using the title for sorting of sporozoites of um, uh, plasmodium, for example. So um, there's actually uh, very um, different applications possible. But in this case, it had been about the um, sorting of cells. And uh, concerning the microchip uh, part of the question, so the microchip is part of these single-use disposable cartridges. Um, you, of course, can um, uh, use uh, these cartridges uh, for up to uh, 500 million cells, which can be loaded inside of 10 milliliters into um, this cartridge type and um, sort them, but uh, as said, the cartridges are single-use disposables, and if you use a new cartridge, you'll also automatically use a new microchip. Then. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, do you know if B cell response is similar? <clears throat> so maybe it's a question for me. So. Um, we have not we have not looked in detail uh, on the B cell response. We have just looked on the antibody response. But overall, in the liter literature, my my um, my um, uh, understanding is that basically everybody develops a beautiful, strong B cell response, and there is no no not such a thing like low of low avidity or low affinity response. Thank you, Alexander. Okay, our next question. Can we correlate with antigenic SIN2? Um, with the antigenic SIN, yeah. Um, so basically, yeah, that was that is actually the original idea that a previous infection leaves a footprint in the immune uh, response and then um, a second infection with, um, with, a, with a similar peptide is influenced by this primary infection. So basically what we are describing is a kind of a antigenic sin, but we see it as a more broader um, phenomenon of a, that in general, a large memory repertoire, as we find it in human, especially in, the, in older humans, um, has a basically a, a, a large repertoire for new antigens. So basically, um, any new epitope will lead to a reactivity of some pre-existing memory T cells. And it, and in general, I think it will be really important to, to study that in the future because that is a, a very big difference between laboratory mice and humans, and I think it has a very strong influence. And now I think this SARS-CoV-2 pandemic um, is teaching us that this might have a strong impact and we see it also in the vaccination. So I think this is really something looking uh, for, especially in the human system and also 
the effect of aging. Thank you, Alexander. Okay, our next question looks like it might be for you, Felix. How many sorting can be done in a single TITO system without changing either the cartridge or the microchip? Yeah, so um, the cartridge input chamber is a volume of 10 milliliters and you go can go up to 50 million cells per milliliter, which um, makes up to 500 million cells you can load into a cartridge, of course, depends on your application, on target cell frequency, and on your expectations on yield and purity, and what um, cell concentration you uh, want to sort, but that is what is possible uh, with one single um, cartridge. And uh, yeah, as I said, the nice thing is that um, the system, the fluidic system, is really completely contained inside the cartridge, so if you exchange that, you will also exchange the fluidic system and um, yeah, this is this is what's possible within one cartridge and therefore also one microchip. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, our next question, have you identified the SARS-CoV-2 signals in the T-cells sCRNA data? Um, I, I'm not completely sure whether you mean that we uh, whether we identified uh, viral viral sequences in the in the in the CD4 T cells. No, so they were they were not infected, or so we did not see any infected cells. Uh, so that was the question. Great, thank you. Okay, our next question: Does how does the Taito cartridge compare to a biosafety cabinet frequently used for cell sorters? So that's also a very good question. Since uh, once you're uh, interested in sorting infectious material using open um, systems producing aerosols and droplets, you need to do that inside a biosafety cabinet. Those are um, most of the time very large instrumentations, quite extensive, um, space consuming. Um, and um, these, um, yeah, biosafety cabinets, they most of the time work with HEPA filters. And uh, HEPA filters have pore sizes of 0.1 to 0.3 micrometers. And um, with the uh, pore size and the, inside the um, um, sterile and hydrophobic membranes, we use inside the micron type of cartridge with 0.1 micrometer pore sizes, we are actually at the same range as these HEPA filters. So it's actually quite comparable, and currently we are also looking into possibilities to even lower the pore size of the filters used inside the cartridge, because um, obviously the variants, um, for example, of SARS-CoV-2, they, they kind of um, different sizes, different diameters, ranging from 50 nanometers to 200 nanometers, um, but uh, the good thing is they're um, always bound to some sort of aerosols and uh, therefore will also be repelled by the hydrophobic membrane. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how um, those systems compare. Thank you, Felix. Okay, our next question, which variant of SARS-CoV-2 was used to study the correlation? And can this correlation differ in other variants of SARS-CoV-2? So we used the the, the, the wild type variant, so the first one, which was um, uh, identified. And I don't think that the, the variants have a, a strong impact on the T cell response. There are too many peptides, too many HLAs. Uh, so I, I don't think that an individual mutation um, will, will will have a strong uh, effect. And that is also supported by the data now that showing actually that the T cell responses are, are equally strong against the variants, as far as I uh, know it. Thank you, Alexander. Looks like we have time for a few more questions here. Our next question, has the Taito also been used to, to sort um, CD4T lymphocytes from HIV positive patients? Yes, indeed. There are also um, uh, researchers using using the instrument in um, HIV research and uh, also use it to, to sort infected lymphocytes um, with uh, the uh, HIV virus, but also 
Um, yeah, as, as I said before, also different kinds of infectious materials have been used from, um, yeah, samples infected with diverse kinds of bacteria, um, viruses, but also, for example, um, parasites, parasites uh, themselves. So, yes, the answer is yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, now, why are strong yet low avidity SARS-CoV-2 T cell responses unable to clear the virus despite showing functional parameters of activation? Um, yeah, that, that's that's actually not. Uh, so I think there are a couple of questions regarding the also whether this affects vaccine safety and so on. This so I think what we have to differentiate uh, between. Um, what the T cell response and the, the, or the immune response is doing to the virus. So I think most, even in the severe cases, they can control the virus. That is not the problem. I think the problem is the, the overreaction of the immune system. And so this is also what we are addressing. We think that, um, I think this is one of the few examples where we can really make a point that severe disease is characterized by a uh, low ability, but strongly expanded uh, uh, antigen-specific response. And we think that this is actually contributing to the immune pathology, but, but this does not negatively, not necessarily uh, negatively affect the virus elimination. So, um, and, and, and also the same is true for the vaccination and so on. Although we see a lower response, um, um, I think the, the, the vaccination is pretty fine. Everybody is developing a strong B, B cell antibody response, so this is the primary goal. And also, um, um, even a low avidity uh, T cell reaction, if it is pre-existing, so before, if you have it before infection, is probably helpful against the virus. The problem is only arising if you have a neo-infection. So if you the first time meet the virus, and then the cells, obviously, the low ability cells, maybe due to the pre-existing memory, they uh, develop into a huge response, uh, which generates a lot of inflammatory cytokines and so on, um, and, and which is maybe also poorly controlled due to the low ability. And that is, that is the idea. But I think the protection is fine. So if it's already there, you are protected. The problem is only an, an a, a infection with a new virus. You know? Well, thank you, Alexander and Felix, for your time today. Do either of you have any final comments for our audience before we go today? Yeah, uh, so I would like to thank the, 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 the audience here for putting all these questions. And um, maybe I, I really want to point out how important it is uh, to measure, to do, to perform these antigen-specific analysis. So also, especially in the T cell field, this is currently not not in the clinical routine. Uh, but uh, it, it might turn out that exactly the knowing exactly the phenotype and the um, functional. Um, Parameters of the of, of the specific T cell response can really be critical and should be um, should be uh, emphasized in the future. And I think also it is important to understand that the techniques used to the, to analyze the cells has a very strong impact, and 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 that is also something the scientific uh, um, community should discuss how we should standardize that, that we can make the results comparable. Thank you. Yeah, and also from my side, thank you very much to the audience and for your interest in that topic. And also thank you, uh, Alexander, for that very nice presentation and for all the learnings uh, we got today. I think that was really, really helpful and it's important work in uh, terms of understanding um, SARS-CoV-2 and uh, yeah, our body's reaction to it in more detail. So thanks for that. And um, yeah, I hope um, you all enjoyed the webinar today. And uh, I hope you also uh, learned a little bit on um, possibilities in order to safely sort infectious material if you're working with such kind of um, applications. Um, and that the Max Quantido is 
um, always a possibility for aerosol-free, safe self-sorting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again, Alexander and Felix. We would also like to thank Labbers and our sponsor, Milton Biotech, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. Labroots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. Until next time, goodbye.